Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to our Airmen Helping Airmen podcast. I am Khalith, your Air Force Aid Society CEO. And today I have with us a very special guest, uh, Amanda Huffman. Now, Amanda is a prior military member. She was in the Air Force uh, as a civil engineer um, for six years. And then she decided to get out and she's been doing just a load, a ton of work for uh, military spouses and women in the military in general. She was recognized as a Hill Vets 100 in 2019, uh, a Women Veteran Trailblazer in 2021. She published her first book in 2019 titled Women of the Military. And in 2019, she also launched a podcast by the same name. So I'll be getting some advice from her on both podcasting and being an author. She's a freelance writer for Clearance Jobs, Military Families, Military Spouse Magazine, Military Crash Pad, and Military.com. And you can find her on all the social uh, media sites with her hashtag of Airman to Mom. Amanda, that's pretty amazing. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I know when you say it all at once, it kind of seems it's a little overwhelming, but that's been years of work. So it's not, I'm not doing all those things at the yeah, same time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to say to you something that people say to me and other uh, service members, you know, all the time. And I'm sure you, uh, I, don't, I, know, I don't know if you used to hear this when you were in the Air Force, but man, thank you for your service, not just as an airman, but the incredible work that you've done uh, after your military career. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, tell me about your time as an airman, as a civil engineer. So I went to college and I did ROTC and my husband and I met in college during the ROTC program and he graduated a year before me and went off to New Mexico and I was lucky enough to get stationed with him. And we were both working as officers in the Air Force and uh, at Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico. It was a really cool time to be at Holloman because the F-117 was retiring and the F-22 was coming there. So as a civil engineer, there was so much construction and lots of activity going along. And at the same time, I was preparing because I knew I probably would deploy within the first four years of being on active duty. And eventually I did get tasked to deploy to Afghanistan with the army on a provincial reconstruction team. And so I spent four months of training for getting ready for the deployment and then nine months in Afghanistan, helping the people of Afghanistan through building schools, roads, government buildings, bridges, and wells and a few other smaller projects. And then when I came home, My husband had got into the Air Force Institute of Technology in Ohio, and my commander was able to get me stationed there as well. And so I came home, I in-processed and then out-processed and moved to Ohio, and I finished my time working at the Air Force Material Command headquarters doing energy management. All right. Well, great. Again, thank, thank you for your service. And I know um, I spent a little time myself in Afghanistan, and I know how challenging that that mission um, certainly was. So again, I, I really appreciate it. Now, uh, let's let's stick with your Air Force career for for a moment. What was the most challenging part of being, specifically, of being a woman uh, in the Air Force? I think probably being in Afghanistan and being attached to an infantry unit, which I couldn't serve in, but was attached to. And it was kind of unexpected. I thought I would deploy, go overseas, be on a base the whole time and never leave the the perimeter of the base. And instead, I got sent on this mission uh, interacting directly with the Afghan people. But Overall, I had a good experience. The I went in 2010, so by the time I went, the Afghan people knew they had to work with women if they wanted to, and they looked past my gender and saw that I was an engineer, and so I didn't really have a lot of difficulties with the people that I worked with. There were just some, like, comments of, like, um, I wasn't, I was married, but I didn't have kids. And in the Afghan tradition, you have to prove that you can have children within the first year. And if not, 
women are broken. And so one of the oh. engineers I worked with would be like, you guys are broken. Cause I was with another woman engineer and they would be like, you guys are broken. You're married and you don't have kids. But besides like the cultural differences, I overall had a good experience and I didn't really have any negative experiences in the military. I had great bosses and I didn't, I actually didn't really know that I, I knew the combat exclusion existed, but I didn't feel like there was anything that I couldn't do that I wanted to do. And so I had a great experience. Yeah, good. And um, I mean, and that's, um, I think the, uh, of many of the women who are currently serving and women veterans, um, there seems to be more uh, females who have had some type of either negative uh, experience with inclusion, with, you know, um, equality and, and whatnot. What about what's been your experience with some of your colleagues or counterparts in terms of or some of the things that you've heard, even since you've um, s- separated from the military, about the challenges that our women face in the military today? I think one of the reasons that I like don't look back and see that I had challenges was because no one was really talking about it. So like, of course, there was discrimination and some form of like harassment towards women, but it was kind of just like, just suck it up and deal with it. Like, that's what you have to do to be part of the military. And now they're working to change it. But in a way, they also put like so much focus and attention on everything that's going on. And it's kind of like this push pull of like, how do I change things so that it's more fair and uh, a better work environment for women? And how do I decide like it's not worth fighting every single battle? And so I think in today's military, even though there's a lot of change happening for women, there's so much focus on everything that's happening that things that I wouldn't have even thought twice about, I would have just been like, whatever, they're guys being guys, is now something that you kind of have to decide like how do you want to react to the situation and what way should you move forward? Should you talk to the person directly? Should you report it? What should you do? And I feel like, I mean, it wasn't easy to be a woman in the military, but it was easy to just ignore all the stuff and not worry about it. And that's part of like why the culture was the way it is. So I think today's women are making huge impacts for the future military because they're standing up, speaking up and, working to change things that have been the status quo for so long. Yeah, no, no doubt that things ha- have improved. I, I still I firmly believe that, you know, we do still have a long way to go in terms of um, how, how we deal with and treat women and minorities and, and whatnot. But uh, it's people like yourself and the work that you've done that you've you've done uh, that I think has made it easier for women in the military today. So, again, uh, thank you so much for uh, what you've done for all of us. So tell me about transition. So you went from being uh, in, in the Air Force in Afghanistan, uh, being ridiculed a little bit for not having children to to being a spouse and a mom. So how, how was that transition? It was really, really hard. I really struggled with the transition. I lost my identity of being a service member, of being an engineer, of having a career to being a stay at home mom. And the military kind of, my husband and I were both active duty. So whenever it was time to move, they would look at both of our careers and try and figure out what the next best next step forward. But then I got out and it was like, well, you don't matter. You're just a spouse. And I was like, what just happened? And so it was more than just leaving the military. I just felt really alone um, because I also transitioned in a non-traditional way. I went from being in a job and working to being a stay-at-home mom. And so I thought that I couldn't relate to other veterans because my experience was so different. And it wasn't until years later when I had a conversation with a friend and he was talking about his experience. And I was like, I feel the same way as you do. And I didn't know that was possible. And so I felt really alone. And then I was also struggling with like finding who I was and finding my next step forward. Yeah. So for the transitioning military members, you know, who are transitioning today, who are about to transition or recently transitioned, you know, what advice would you give them for how you were able to pull yourself out of 
um, the funk or what, what, however you may term it, uh, when you first transitioned. So you said you had a really difficult time. What things and what strategies did you use to kind of uh, pull yourself out of that place? So I, I think part of it is it takes time. I don't think I haven't talked to anyone who was like, oh yeah, leaving the military was easy. Even if they had like a career set up, it was always like, it's a change, it's a transition. And so I think part of it is to understand that there's going to be things that you can't prepare for and to understand that it will take time to adjust to your new normal. It's just like reintegration from deployment. Like it takes time. You can do everything you can to prepare for it, but you you're still going to reintegrate and there's going to be unexpected things. And so one of the things was just as time went on, I was able to find uh, my new place and figure out where I was supposed to be. But I also started following my passion for writing, which was something that I felt, I, I mean, I have my civil engineering degree. I actually had my professional engineering license. And so I felt like I'm not supposed to write. I'm supposed to be an engineer. Like that's what my qualifications, but I had so much passion for writing and it was where I found interest and it excited me and engineering. I was like, yeah, that was fun, but I don't want to do that again. And so I think being open to follow what your passion is and not what you're trained for per se, because I think a lot of times you pick a career um, in college or out of high school to join the military and you're a mechanic for 20 years and like maybe you like it but it's not your passion and I, th- I think don't be afraid to follow your passion and you have so many skills that the military taught you that can correlate into so many different jobs that you don't have to worry that like I don't have all this like I'm wasting all this stuff that I learned because so much of the engineering stuff I use in my podcasting Stuff mm-hmm. which sort of doesn't make spirit, make sense, but all the skills you learn in the military you can use in another career and and follow what you love because then it'll then it'll make you happy. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really sound advice. You know, first be patient. It takes time to make any transition, and I think that's true. I had I recently transitioned myself, and be passionate or follow your passion and find the thing that you love. And I think that uh, will also help with uh, transition. So, really good advice. What about you know? You seem to have created and have a real sense of uh, community and belonging with the things that you've done since you transitioned. Did you have? Uh, that same sense of community? Did you have a people surrounding you when you first uh, transitioned? No, I, I, I talked about how lonely I felt. And at first, I kind of got involved in the military spouse community and pretended that the veteran part of me didn't really exist because mm. it was really easy to relate. I mean, I was not that I wasn't a veteran, but I was a military spouse. That was like we were getting ready to move a year after I got out. Um, we moved to LA and I was really involved in the military spouse community and I made really good friends. And so that was where like the community aspect started. But as I was working on military spouse things, uh, whenever I would talk about being a veteran and a military spouse or being a veteran, people were like, that's really interesting. That's really different. And so I kind of got pulled by the military spouses to push away from being military spouse focused and start focusing on women veterans. And the more I pulled at the women veteran thread, it led to me wanting to help women who are joining the military. And so it's just been a process of following where the next step is. And, and like you, like in the intro, you said I did all these things, but that's like, I, I got out in 2013 and now it's 2021. So it's not like, it took me six months. It took me lots and lots of time to figure out where to go. Yeah, good. You you said you're very passionate about writing, and so you published your your first book. Uh, first, tell tell us about the process. You know, of writing a book. It seems exciting. I'm I'm on the verge of writing my first book, and and so I'm a little bit excited, a little bit nervous. But then I'm also interested in. Like what, what, what's your book? Tell your, our audience, you know, what the book is, is about. So my first book is a compilation of stories and it's 
a bunch of interviews that I did. Before I started the podcast, I was doing written interviews back and forth, and I was really struggling to get enough people to write back via email. And so while I was working on collecting the interviews, I started to pivot and thought that I would do podcasting. And originally I was planning on using the written interviews as like a backup plan because I had struggled so hard to get enough women to write for the book. I was like, how am I going to get women to fill up each week of a podcast? And so they were like my backup plan for the weeks that I didn't have anyone, but I ended up not having weeks where I didn't have anyone. And It was a lot easier with a podcast to just set up an interview and get it done. And so I was like, hey, let what? me just jump in. Let me jump in for just one second, because I'm interested in. And why do you think it was so difficult to get women to participate in the, the interviews? I think the written, it was really just people got busy. They all I had like uh, about 100 women fill out the initial survey. But then when I would send the survey back. Um, to ask follow-up questions, it would either go to their spam folder or they would be busy and say, I'll get back to you. And then they never did. And so I think it was just that like people wanted to do it. And then I don't think a lot of people like to write. I know a lot of people want to write books, but I I was asking like tough questions and I needed more than like, <laughs> yes, no. Um, yeah, and so yeah. I, think, I think it was a little bit of like the like the challenge of writing and then finding the time to write and then maybe getting lost in the email chain um, or loud in the interweb somewhere. But okay. yeah. yeah, cause I had a huge initial response and that was how I started the podcast was by emailing those people who had never finished the survey and wanted to be, wanted to tell their story, but the podcast medium made it easier. And so that was how I started. Mm-hmm. So you were simultaneously working on your book and you started a podcast or did you, write the book and then you start the podcast afterwards. I I had all the interviews done. I was actually going to use them for a blog series, but we, that was the year we moved and I felt really overwhelmed. And my friend was like, you don't have to do the blog series if you're really overwhelmed. And so I took her advice. And so I had those written. um, And then I started doing the interviews in October, November of 2018. And then I launched the podcast in January. Okay. Yeah. And through through all of your um, work in both your book and your podcast, what have been some of the more important discoveries in speaking to many of these um, women veterans? How much commonalities women have with other women or just veterans in general. There's so many commonalities between the different groups of people. And there's this like, amazing community. I say like the military is great and we had a great community, but then the veteran community, it's like so much better because you have all the branches, enlisted officer doesn't matter, all the different career fields. And so it just changes the dynamics and like builds this instant community among all the women. And that's what's really, I think is what's so cool about it. So what what really made you uh, shine the light on the contrib- contributions that women make in in the military? So initially, I started focusing on deployments because I had deployed and um, I thought it was really important that people knew about what women and men were doing overseas, um, not just in the current war. Well, it's over now, but at the time as the war in Um, Afghanistan was going on, but also what had been done in Iraq and World War II and as many stories as I can find. And it ended up that almost every person who responded to my survey was a woman. And I was like, oh, (laughs) women, (laughs) they're in the military. And so I, I thought it would be really easy to get like all these people that I deployed with, mainly men to respond. But the only people who responded from my deployment were women and then other women signed up to tell. And they told these stories and I was like, this is amazing. Like women are pretty awesome. And so I, I was curious about hearing more stories. So instead of focusing on deployments, I switched to women and that was where that happened. So it was kind yeah. of by accident. Okay. And based on your, you know, your experience and, and what you've done in the space that you've been working, 
in over the last few years. What do you think the military uh, can do? What more can be done to level the playing field when it comes to equality in women? How can we get more women in positions of leadership? How can we get more women, uh, you know, being afforded the same opportunities as their male counterparts? I think uh, the military has already done a lot of great things since I left the military, because when I left in 2013, I knew that I was going to probably deploy within uh, six months to a year after my son was born. And I think that change of six months to a year of being home, it doesn't seem like that much time. I mean, it's twice as much time, but it's like I couldn't get past the fact of like saying goodbye to my six month old to do what needed to be done. And so that was a real struggle. And then I think uh, the main thing that I think we need to do to change, like to increase our numbers is to focus on recruiting women. That's why I'm kind of shifting my focus more towards helping women who are joining the military, because I don't think there's enough resources out for women who are looking to join the military. And so I created a girl's guide to the military. That's like a free guide that helps them answer questions about what branch to join and what basic training is like. And I'm working on trying to expand those resources to help get women in the military. If we have more women, then more women will stay. And so right now it's less than 20% of the force is women. And so it makes it really hard for our numbers to increase when you don't have more than 30%. Yeah. So speaking of, you know, the work that you're doing with respect to women who are joining the military, if you could give, you know, there's a young lady listening now. She's thinking about joining the Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard or Space Force. Um, You know, what's the one piece of advice you would offer to a person uh, that's on the fence about should I join the military or or not? I would try and find a woman veteran to talk to, to hear their experience and try and find someone who's in your branch that you're looking or the career field that you're looking for. Um, If you get the girl's guide, you can email me. And I love connecting women who are joining the military with women who have served in the military, because I think like I can't answer everyone's question about what it's like to be in the Navy, but I do know women who have served in the Navy. So I can help connect them with other women. And so if you're thinking about joining the military, I think the best advice is to talk to other women, hear their experiences, listen to the women of the military podcast, and then reach out because I'm happy to help. Okay, good. Uh, that's, that's pretty amazing. And I'm sure our listeners, and we'll make sure that we have links to all of your social media and uh, a way for them to make sure they can get a copy of the girl's guide. You've been doing a lot of great work. What's the most rewarding part of all the things that you've been doing? The mentorship that I've got to do with young women who are joining the military, they, they are the ones who email me the most and the mm-hmm. ones who ask me questions. And I'm so excited that I can help them in their journey because I, I met my friend invited me to go to ROTC and I was in the process of enlisting. And if he hadn't told me about ROTC, it would have totally changed the trajectory of my journey. So I'm really passionate in helping to ensure that women know all the different options available and then they pick what's best for them. It's not that enlisting is bad and being an officer is good. It's you need to figure out what the best thing is for you. So I try and help women figure out the best path for them and then do everything I can. And it just, it keeps me going. And so. I love talking to them. Nice. And I'm sure uh, they absolutely appreciate it. Now, you did mention when we were talking about your book, you said my first book was (laughs) about. So that indicates to me that you're thinking about writing more. What's what's next on the uh, on the agenda for you? Yeah, I am currently writing a book to help expand the girl's guide and um, make it into a book so that it'll have more resources, more information. And um, hopefully. It's it's a lot more challenging than writing a book of interviews because they got to do the hard part of answering all the questions. And so <laughs> there's been many iterations, many challenges, um, many chapters added, taken away. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been a lot of work, but I'm getting closer to being finished and I'm excited when I'll be able to announce it officially. Nice. And for our uh, women 
veterans uh, or women currently serving or really for anyone who might be thinking about uh, writing a book since you have some experience? What advice would you give uh, to to an aspiring author? Uh, I would say uh, start writing as the first step and then don't be afraid to let your network know that you're writing a book. I happen, I'm actually also working on my memoir, which is kind of like my back burner side project. And I wrote on Twitter about how I was writing my memoir and a woman veteran reached out and she is actually a writer and like helps people edit their books. She's an editor and she's helping coach me through writing my memoir for free. And I'm like, that's crazy. And so if you're, if you're looking to write, either pay someone to be a writing coach, because I think that's a valuable tool or reach out to your network and see what resources are available because writing a book is a lot of work and you need extra set of eyes. And so any help you can get is invaluable. Yeah. Okay. Here's a million, million dollar question for you, Amanda. So you're a spouse, you're a mom, you're an author who is currently writing two books, kind of, right? You're, you have a podcast, you write for several other publications and you're doing all this advocacy work for females in, in the, the military. How do you balance it all? How do you <laughs> find time for yourself, uh, for your family and whatnot? What's the key to finding balance or harmony with such a important uh, yet busy life? I think the biggest lesson I learned last year was learning to say no Um, because at first I was trying to say yes to every opportunity and was like, oh, I have to do it because I need to get my name out there and I need, but not all opportunities are the right fit for me and not all opportunities are worth the time that is required. And so I'm learning how to say no to things that aren't on mission. I'm really focused on like helping women join the military. And so I try and stay focused on that. And if something comes up, that's an opportunity that may, I I always get excited. It may sound really cool, but it's not uh, online with my mission. Then I have to say no to it. And it's kind of changing like how I'm running my business and how I'm operating it. And learning to say no is like really important because you can't say yes to everything. You got to find the right fit. Absolutely. Another great piece of advice. You've really, I think, left our listeners and and me included with some some really unique things to to think about. And uh, we just all really appreciate uh, your service and everything that you've done for females uh, in the military, women in in the military. So, uh, again, I want to say thank you for joining us today. And but before we go, uh, any last words for our listeners? Last word. I think that if you served in the military, you have something special to offer to the world and your service doesn't stop just because you left the military. I thought when I left the military, like I went to Afghanistan, it's like the one big thing, but now I have a podcast and a purpose again and it's just so fulfilling. So your service doesn't have to stop just because you left the military. Yeah. Again, sound, sound advice. So, uh, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again for your service. Thank you for the wonderful work that you continue to do for women in the military, the work that you do to inspire uh, future uh, uh, military members uh, in in all of the, the services. We really appreciate it. Best of luck to you in your memoir and in your next book and all the work that you continue to do for our women in the military. So thank you once again. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been your Airman Helping Airman podcast. I'm Khalif, the CEO of Air Force Aid Society, and I am just honored to have with us Uh, have joined us today, Amanda Huffman. So Amanda, thank you once again. Thank you.